Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Please sing with us a couple hymns this morning. Uh, if you guys wouldn't mind standing for our first hymn, it's a nice rousing song. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. be seeing Faith is the Victory, page 608 in the hymnal.
Happy Sabbath, church family. You guys all look very beautiful. I want to I wanna welcome um, everyone here, and I would like to ask our church family to um, bow our heads for the opening prayer and invocation. Um, dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today to worship you and give you honor and glory. Um, you are the Most High, you are Jehovah, and you are the Great Physician. We um, give you gratitude and thanks for your infinite love and mercy as high as the heavens and as deep as the ocean. We invite you, invite you today to be with us um, as we listen to speaker Anthony Baca. Please give us your infinite knowledge and um, ult um, ultimate understanding so that we can understand his message through, um, through his message today. We pray all these things and Jesus Christ's holy name and our personal savior and our best friend. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. All right. So today, uh, we have not done this in a while. So I would like you to turn to your right. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> turn to each other, turn to the person next to you and say hello. And then turn to the other side and say hello. <laughs> yes. Now I'm going to have you, I'm going to ask you to all stand up actually. And then turn around to a person behind you or next to you and say hi. <laughs> Isn't that nice? All right, so we welcome all our visitors. If I may request all the visitors to please stand up that we may know who you are. Yes, we see visitors here. Awesome. And welcome, welcome, welcome to our church. Thank you. Okay, and yes, so we actually have potluck later so we can actually get to know you more. Our speaker for today is one of um, a very good friend of mine, Anthony Vaca. Um, he's actually a person who has a wealth of knowledge, but you wouldn't know that, you know, like his, his transformed life. You have to ask him personally. He's helped me quite a bit, and he doesn't know this, and I've never told him of how it is to actually have a personal Bible study. So I thank you for coming. For our announcements today, and I actually lost my clicker. Oh, there it is. It's not working, but we'll make do. Okay, so our speaker again today is Anthony. And next slides, please. Okay, this is very, very important. We have potluck. So please stay behind afterwards to fill up our belly with very good food. Because of course, the way to our hearts is through our very nice stomach. And it's very good, healthy food. So please stay behind. And after potluck as well, there are small groups that are happening, and one of them is praise and worship, and it actually happens over there in the back by the um, garden area. Usually also, there is a women's uh, ministry as well that's happening in the library. So when you go to that hall, onto the right, there's a library, and Atiana is actually going to be leading that. And also in the afternoon, we have a small group study here inside uh, for the younger generation. For Wednesday nights, um, make, there's a weekly uh, midweek prayer meeting, and it's virtual at 7 o'clock in the evening time. 
So this is an exciting news that I am really, really excited to tell you all about. Okay, this is our garden project. So if you actually go to the back today, you'll see things that are growing. And it's actually beautiful to see. And it's very encouraging. So one thing that uh, happened this week was we got more worms. Worms from Uncle Bunchar. Thank you so much for bringing them. And um, do you know how many, for those who do not know, I mean, aside from our gardener friends here, guess how many trees are planted in the garden? 20? 32. Wow, just imagine by next year, springtime, summertime, we will be harvesting them. Wow. Do you know what kind of trees we have? Let me tell you. Banana, sapote, and um, avocados. We have four different kinds of cherries, actually. Yeah, we have cherries. We have plums, we have pomegranate, we have peach. Wow, what a beautiful thing to see. Um, durian, not yet. If you have one, we may have some planted here. But yeah, something to look forward to. Okay, and then so please pray that, you know, especially since the weather has been very hot, you know, uh, our prayer has been that God will put a put a cloud over, over these trees. I want to tell you, friends, you know, just being working in the garden, it really has taught me so many things of how even the creation, when God actually created the vegetation before sun, moon, and stars, you know, I always wondered, why? Why did it happen that way? Didn't vegetation require um, the, the sunlight? But I realized that, you know, that's why we plant things when things are cooler. So the new plants will not be affected by heat. Very amazing things. So come to the garden. We always welcome people to come and help, help weed, help water, and help in many different ways. So we're usually there Sundays, and for the most part, um, there's usually some of us who've been coming there after work, Monday to Thursday, and then Friday again, we're there. So come and, and join forces and help in any way that we can so that we could actually witness together how it's like to have a barren land grow to bearing. Okay, um, so this week's, this week's offering is going to be for our local church budget. Wanted to tell you that how our local budget works is that when we actually uh, contribute to this, it actually is distributed into many different departments in our, in our church. So when we contribute for our church budget this week, it actually goes to also one of them, for example, is our care group fund. So I just wanted to let you know. And so I will ask now for our deacons to please come for our prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for the many blessings that you have given to us. And thank you, Lord, that all these resources that you have given to us, Lord, are not ours, but are yours. So, Lord, I ask that you please make us good stewards of them. So, Lord, take our lives and make us whole and help us, Lord, to give and give just as like you have given everything to us without holding anything back. Thank you so much for being our good God. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let's just stand up to sing. Today, the scripture reading are found in 1 John chapter 5, verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true. In his Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. Now, can, if you can please um, kneel or whoever can please um, kneel for uh, prayers. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for the Sabbath day. Thank you for helping us every each day of our life. Please send the Holy Spirit for us so that we can live by your words. And please um, be with each of every one of us. Send us the Holy Spirit so that um, we can walk with you please be with all of our church member the one who are here and the one who are not here please take care of them please be with all the sick people because you are the great physician so that you can heal them and then when they can come back and um, work for you and then spread your word and your gospel Please also be with um, the people that who are not here today and who are traveling. Please um, take care of them. And please also um, forgive us for the sin that we have done wrong to you. Um, also be with the, our speaker today, um, Anthony, so that we can hear your word and understanding and meet you May you give him a Holy Spirit and be with him so that he can speak your word and then um, we can hear them and learn from the word today. Um, please also be with all of our children and grandchildren also. May they grow up to be your servant and learn on your word. Um, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Isabella and Zion and Nathan. Not you. No, just kidding. <laughs> For 
there's Isabella. Oh, there she is. Good morning, children. Good morning. Oh my goodness, I couldn't hear it. Good morning, children. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Fine. Okay, happy Sabbath. Okay, our story for today is that, let me ask you first, um, how many of you guys have a uh, favorite, like, you know, things that you like to keep like toys, like a favorite toy. What is your favorite toy, Nathan? What's your favorite, what's your favorite toy? Isabella, what's your favorite toy? Um, teddy bear. Teddy bear, how about you? Alisa, what's, what's your favorite toy? Um, cars. Cars, and you? Jeans. You like cars too? Yeah. yeah. I like dump truck. Trucks? Oh, I know he loves trucks. So, yeah. So, and all of us have favorite things, you know, like there are some things that are so valuable to us, you know, we want it to be on our side because I know a lot of here, they're, they're, they value their phones. Yeah, that your teddy bear, okay? Yeah, so, <laughs> so um, some, sometimes you like the phones or... I have some stuff here that's like my favorite too. Like I have a favorite clip, you know. This, this is my favorite clip, Isabella, you know. Although I don't have a long hair, you know. Okay. And then um, I have a favorite headbands. And this one is, um, this is my favorite watch. You know, some, this, is, this is not a watch that you wear, but this is like a watch, but a very good friend of mine gave it to me, so I value this. You know, I kept it. This is already dead, but I kept it for years and years and years and years because this is very important to me and is valuable. And one day I was at the store. Yes, it's a watch. Okay. Um, I went to the store and I found this wallet. I mean, coin purse. It brings back memories to me. Because when I was growing up, I liked coin press because I always put my money in there, like coins. Until um, when I was like after my school many, many years ago. So I still have a coin purse. And I used to sing a lot before. I used to sing and I make money for singing. So I always put my money in my coin purse. You want to see my coin purse? See, that's my coin purse. Um, yeah, one. this is your wallet. Yes. <laughs> so, um, one day, after I got paid, when I, you know, when I do my singing, I got paid. But, because during my time, you don't get paid a lot when you sing. Not like today, you know. But um, that's like my um, help for my grandmother, who's raising me. So, every time I get paid, I put my money in there, and I go to the store. And I, um, as I go to the store, I will go shopping for my favorite fruit, like bananas, you know, and like oranges and stuff like that. And I also buy some veggies and things that we can eat for dinner. So I put it in my cart, holding my purse, and then I fell in line. And then when I fell in line, I just realized I lost my purse. So, I'm worried about my purse because that's my favorite purse. That's my yeah. favorite that coin purse. favorite purse. Yes, that's my favorite. You can hold on to this, okay, and give it back to me later, okay? So, and then, but the only, the most important thing is that the money is in there. How can I? Yeah, it's, okay. there's some money. There's some money in there, okay. So, I can't. I mean, I won't be able to pay my food. My grandma is going to be hungry. And we are not going to have dinner. And, you know, all those um, things that I put in the cart, you know, I won't be able to get it. So I was really, really sad. Not only for my purse, but we're not going to have dinner. We're not going to eat. So 
What I do is that I just set. Okay. Uh, there's no more food. Yes, there's no more food. So as I go to the line and then I set aside my cart, I said, you know what? I better go back where I went the first time. I went back to the bananas. I went back to the veggies. I went back to the oranges. I did not see no purse. I was really, really sad. My tears are already coming out of my eyes because, you know, I, I sing and get paid and then I have nothing. So, um, you know, I just went to the corner and I just prayed to God. You know, that's the very first thing that I, I did. I prayed to God and I said, you know what, God, I humble myself. And um, if ever there's anyone here at the store, find my purse. Let it be someone that needed it more than me. Let it be someone that maybe they're not going to be eating tonight or tomorrow. And they found that purse. So, and I said, Jesus, amen. And I went out and I saw the security guard by the door. And then so happened that I asked him, I said, did anybody turn in a wallet? And so he said, let me help you. Let us go to the clerk. You know, there's a customer service area, you know, where the workers are. And I asked, have you found a blue wallet, a coin purse? And then they said, do you have your name on it? I don't have a name on it, but I know how much it cost. You know, because I got paid like about $25.30. So when the, the lady opened the, the coin purse, it's exactly $25.30. So that's my coin purse. So I was so happy and I was so thankful. So children, you should remember, I will share you a verse um, this morning on 1 Peter uh, 5 verse 6. Remember that God is strong and powerful, so be humble in front of him. Then he will lift you up to a good place at the right time. Okay, who wants to pray? Isabella, you want to pray? Come on. Okay, let's bow our heads. Bow our heads. Bow our heads. Dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> because you love us so much. <laughs> because? Because? You love Mom. us so much. So much. You always? Can you make the heart? You always? That's it. Okay. You're good, doing good. You always? You always? Take care. Take care. Of us. Of oh, us. Uh, in Jesus' name, we pray. We pray. Amen. Amen. Right, you can go back to your seat. Sabbath, everyone. Um, so the song we're gonna sing is an old song. The the lyrics goes, um, you know, when the time comes, I want to be ready. When the time comes, you know, I want to be there. So, yeah, and it's just, you know, a lot of people seem to like the idea of God as you know our savior, our friend, but is He also the Lord of our lives? You know, He's the Lord too. So. And the steps of, steps of Christ, it says, um, God doesn't require us to give up anything that it is for our be best interest to retain. And recently, um, God has been teaching me a lesson of like holding everything loosely in my hands and like having an open hands and just give everything to him so that I won't put all my identity and hope and 
yeah, hope and identity in that thing that I idolize. So, yeah, so are we ready when Jesus comes? Because it's going to be soon. So, yeah, may this song speak to us uh, in a very personal way. Good morning. Didn't know which microphone I should use, so I'm going to use the right one, I guess. Okay. Happy Sabbath. I'm excited to be here. I have seen this church many a times. I came here for a meal one time, actually, many years ago. I didn't know how big the church was. I only made it into the fellowship hall. That's as far as I got. I ate. I heard, a, I think, a song or two, and then I left. It was I think a Christmas thing like five or six years. It was a while ago. So it's my first time in the sanctuary at this church. I was um, converted into the Christian faith uh, at the Loma Linda Filipino Church right down the street. And so I was an atheist at the time when I became a Christian. And so my life radically changed not very far from here. But I always saw your church. And so I've always wanted to come by. So I'm glad that Providence worked itself out for me to be here. Awesome. We have our slides up. And they work. Perfect. Before we begin, a few quick things. Number one, 
The text will be on the screen. I put all the verses up there. I believe I put them all up there um, to make it easy and for the flow of the service. However, please, 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 the last person you should ever trust is a preacher. Amen. That was way too quiet. The last person you should ever trust is a preacher. Amen. Um, this isn't a biology lecture. This isn't a chemistry lecture. This isn't a how-to on YouTube. This is discussing eternal spiritual things that could radically affect your life and your salvation. Does that make sense? And so you should never trust anyone just because they say it because they're speaking from a pulpit. Um, even if they read a Bible text or two, you really should study these things for your self. The enemy is a wise and cunning one. And I always encourage those that I share with, please, please, please study for yourselves. If you can't keep up with me, well, I can get a little too excited. Trust me, I love the Bible. Amen. I get a little too excited. I might go too fast. I will email you all my slides if you just ask me. It's no problem. You can have my slides. It doesn't bother me at all. I want you just to look at the verses for yourself. If you can't keep up, I encourage you to take notes. Um, if you have your own Bibles, I encourage you to follow along. does not matter the translation whatsoever. Uh, follow along. I just encourage you to get into your own Bibles and make that a habit and a part of your daily life. Amen. Uh, number two, a little bit about me. I wasn't born and raised in an Adventist Christian home. I was a convert as an adult. And so there are uh, certain stories and illustrations that I will use that will piggyback off of that. But in no way does any story of my before Christ life encourage people to do it themselves. Amen. Uh, sometimes I'll use these old illustrations and stories because they get a, a, a beautiful point across, but in no way do we ever want to condone or encourage a lifestyle contrary to the Bible. So I wanted to share that as well. Let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we're going to dive into our Bible study today. Father, bless us as we study, as we read, as we think. Clear our minds from distractions from this week. I ask especially, Lord, that even in this service, forgive us, Lord, for allowing our minds even sometimes to be clouded and to miss out on the blessings that we've already received. And I just ask that you would, at this time, give us a divine focus. Help us to hear your still, small voice speaking to us personally, that we might receive some blessing. You brought us here for some reason. You knew that we would be here today. You knew I would share. You knew they would be sitting here. So, Lord, you have a blessing for all of us. Help us not to miss our blessing, we earnestly pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for the special music, by the way. That was the perfect song choice. I couldn't have picked a better song for this topic, and you'll see that as we go. Today's presentation is entitled, The Lost Art of Christianity. It's actually part of a six-part series, uh, but we're just going to go ahead and look at one of those parts today. And it's called, The Power of the Mind. The power of the mind. 1 John 5.20 was our, our scripture reading. The Bible says here, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know Him who is true, and we are in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Now, I love this verse, and if I had more time, we would go much slower through the text, and I would ask lots of questions to really get your minds churning, uh, but I do want to end on time. When I read this text, I think of a question. Why did Jesus come? Why did the Son of God come? The text tells us why he came. Now, if I were just to ask you in passing, hey, are you a Christian? You'd probably say yes. Oh, good. Why did Jesus come? Just think to yourselves, what would you say to someone who asked you that question? Okay, to save those who are lost. Did Jesus come to save the lost? Yes or no? Of course he did. What did he come to do for the sick? Heal the sick. What did he come to do for those in captivity? Set them free, right? Um, ooh. Did he come to die the death that you deserve? Well, I mean, yeah, yeah, he did, right? Yeah, so he came to die the death that the wages of sin is death. So he came to die that death in our place that we deserve. So did Jesus come to do one thing or many things? Many things. But I'm going to suggest to you that everything Jesus did was actually all accomplishing one thing. 
And that's 1 John 5.20. It says here that he came to give us an, an understanding. An understanding, but of what? That we may know him. That's why I love the song so much, right? When the time comes, I want him to know me, right? It, Jesus came so that you can know God. That you can know God. Now, that doesn't maybe quite sit in the mind necessarily. Like, wait, wait, what does it mean that we can know God? We're going to talk a, a little bit about this. This idea of what it means to know God and how to experience that for myself. Because this is why Jesus came, that you can know him. If you have your Bibles, this one's not going to be on the screen. Take your Bibles and go to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, the Bible tells us, it shows us how important it is to know him, to know God, whatever this knowing of him might mean. Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to begin in verse 21. The Bible says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Question. Are these atheists in, in the verse? Are these unbelievers in the verse? No, because what do they call God? They call him Lord. And I was an atheist, so I can tell you this. When I was an atheist, I never called Jesus Lord. Atheists don't do that. But these people call Jesus Lord. But the Bible says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. So does every Christian who claims to be a Christian make it into the kingdom of heaven? No. Why? Verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Now, I don't know about you, but if you were sitting at potluck and you were talking to a church member sitting right across from you, and you said, hey, uh, we'll just say Bob. Hopefully there's no Bob in the room. Um, hey, Bob, how was your week? Ah, you know, it was normal. It was average. It was good. Cast out three demons. Open the eyes of two blind people. Raise one person from the dead. And uh, walked across Big Bear Lake to get to the other side to help a boy that was drowning. Question. Would you be amazed? Realistically, you would probably be amazed somewhat. Yeah, right? <laughs> You'd, be <amazed. laughs> You'd be like, you are definitely going where? You would be tempted to think, most of us would be tempted to think, this person, if anyone's going to heaven... This brother or sister is on their way to heaven. But notice what the Bible says, that these people claim to have done all these wonderful miracles, but then verse 23 says, And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So this group of people who are doing all these great things, did they go into the kingdom of heaven? No. Now I'm sure not many of you attempted to open the eyes of the blind this week. I'm sure not many of you have tempted to raise the dead this week, and I'm not saying that that's not even remotely possible. I'm just saying I don't think many of us have attempted it this week. So let me change the list a little bit to help us get the principle in the text. Could we say, Lord, Lord, did I not go to a prayer meeting in your name? Lord, Lord, did I not knock on doors and pass out literature in your name? Lord, Lord, didn't I go to church on the right day in your name? Lord, Lord, didn't I lead out in song service? Wasn't I an elder in the church? Didn't I do all these wonderful things? See, in the Bible, it teaches us that we don't walk into the kingdom of heaven because of what we do. And this is so fundamentally important, we can't miss it. You don't walk in because of what you do. You walk in because of who you, who you know. Amen? Amen? Notice what Jesus said in verse 23. Please look at it. Don't miss it. He says, I declared to you, I never knew you. Notice what he did not say. He did not say, I declared to you, you did not memorize enough Daniel and Revelation prophecies. He did not say, I declare unto you, you do not know your 28 fundamental beliefs and five verses for each of them. 
Now, I was a Bible teacher for 10 years. I'm not saying you shouldn't do those things. You should do those things, amen? But notice, he does not give some grand test to get into heaven. He simply says, do I, do I know you? Do you know me? Do we know each other? The word in the original language, gnosko, means to know, but it means to know by interpersonal experience. Let me give you a, an example to illustrate this. Who here has ever eaten sushi before? Anyone ever eat sushi? Okay, so I come from a Hispanic family, and where I grew up as a younger kid, we didn't have a lot of Asians around us, and so we eventually moved to Southern California, uh, to the Redlands area. I had a lot of Oriental friends, and I was like, hey, what are you guys eating? And they pulled out sushi. And I remember looking at this for the first time, and I was like, what in the world is that? See, I'm Hispanic. What color is rice supposed to be when it's cooked? Red, right? It's supposed to be yellow, <laughs> depending on your culture, right? My culture, rice is cooked when it's red. When it's white, it's not cooked yet. And so here I am looking at white rice, some raw vegetables. I don't eat raw vegetables growing up. I eat vegetables on pizza and a cheeseburger growing up. So I'm like, some raw vegetables and some raw other stuff in there. <laughs> Some fish in there, some raw fish in there. And then it's all wrapped up in this beautiful, interesting green grass called seaweed. And I was like, wait, seaweed? Like the green stuff in the ocean where I fish? They're like, yeah, seaweed. I was like, who would eat this stuff? Uncooked food wrapped in grass. So I was like, I'm good. And for the longest time, I said, no, no, no. And my friends were telling me, no, no, trust us. It's good, it's good, it's good. Question. Could I have known it was good if my friends were telling me it was good, yes or no? Well, in theory, if you have enough people telling you something is good, more than likely it's probably, that's probably good, right? We call that belief or truth by authority. Someone who is, has experience has told you that something is true, and because of their position or their experience, you just believe them. How many of you, when you your a kid, your mother t told you not to touch the stove because it was hot? Okay. Did you have to test that theory and say, I wonder if she's really accurately describing the stove and you touched it yourself? Did, how many of you had to do that? Okay, a couple of us. I actually did that too. But not very few of us do that, right? Because we don't like truth by authority. That's why. Uh, and so you just know it's hot because who said it? Your mom said it. How many of you have ever taken a biology class or a chemistry class? Yeah, you probably definitely take truth by authority then. Because I doubt that you replicated every single experiment that you talked about in your class to know for yourself that that thing is actually true. Teacher said it, it just must be as true as we can possibly believe what it is for today. Does that make sense? We, we go by truth by authority more than we actually give it credit for. And so that's one way to know. The other way to know is truth by experience. See, you can know something is good because a bunch of people say it's good, or you can know it's good because you've tried it for yourself. You see, one day I decided to take that sushi, to, and then, then we dipped it in some dark sauce, this like fermented soy sauce. Right? I was like, I don't even know what I'm doing. So I dipped it, I ate it, and it was good. <laughs> like it was life-changing good. See, I eventually believed it was good because my friends all liked it. So I thought, man, it must be good. But I believed it was good because they said it. But when I ate it, I knew it was good for myself. In the New Testament, there are two different Greek words for knowing. There's knowing by authority and knowing by experience. God is saying, I don't know you by experience. Look, God knows you better than you know yourself. So you understand that, right? The Bible says he knows the number of hairs on your head. Who here has counted the number of hairs on your head? Okay, God knows you better than you know yourself. How many of you can count every tear you've ever cried in your life? God has stored them all in a bottle according to the psalmist. He can literally bring to remembrance every tear you've ever cried. God knows you better than you know yourself. It's not, the Bible's not saying he doesn't know about you. He's saying he doesn't know you by experience. And so that takes us into our subject today, knowing God by experience. How can we practically, tangibly know God for ourselves by experience? 
And that's what I want to talk about today. I'm not sure if we can click that for me. It's, uh, let's see if we can get there. Oh, wow. So I converted it to PowerPoint. Clearly, that did not work well for us. Let's see if the verse has worked out. So we're going to look at three simple points today. The first point is the power of the mind. We need to understand the power of the mind. Praise God, they work. Power of the mind. Power of the mind that God gave us. God created us with a brain, and we need to understand how powerful it is to really grasp how we can experience God today. Jude verse 5 says, But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And so what I want to point out here is what is the author doing for the people? It's right there. He's reminding them. He says, I want to remind you, though you once knew this. Now, that's just a, a way of saying, when you say, though you once knew this, that's another way of saying that you have forgotten. Now, that makes sense, right? It makes sense. A good teacher, preacher, evangelist, pastor is going to remind people of things that they have forgotten. So the book of Jude is intended to remind people of information that they forgot. How many of you forget information? I remember there was a time I went to a youth event, and this was years ago when I was a brand new Christian, and I went to this particular event, and it was powerful. They gave an appeal. I stood up for the appeal. I had tears in my eyes. I went to the front for prayer, and fast forward about six months later, someone who didn't go asked me, hey, how was that event? Oh, it was amazing. It was powerful. What did the preacher preach about? Um... Um, it was powerful, bro. It was so powerful. It was life-changing, powerful. Did they give an appeal? Oh, yeah, they gave an appeal. Did you go forward? Yeah, I went forward. Nice. What was the appeal about? Um, bro, it was so powerful, you just had to have been there, right? <laughs> I couldn't remember the details of this event that I had gone to because as humans, it's natural that we tend to forget. So we often need to be reminded. The New Testament authors are actually constantly saying, we're reminding you. We're reminding you. Did you know God isn't trying to teach you something new? He's trying to just get you to think about what you already know. He's trying to get you mindful. Now, 2 Peter 1.12 takes this to the next level. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. Though you know and are established in the present truth. Now, I want you to notice the difference in the two verses. The first one, I'm going to remind you because you forgot. The second text on the screen, I'm going to remind you even though you are doing it. Is that interesting? The author literally says, I, and he, he goes so far to say... Peter says he would be a negligent minister if he wasn't telling you what you already knew. Now, I know none of you ever felt that way when a pastor gets to the preach and he talks about the second coming, and you're like, dude, I've heard this sermon like 10 times already. Well, if he's reminding you of what you already know, that's actually a good thing. Amen? Because truth only changes you when you actually are thinking about it when you're thinking. So the Bible here says, Jude, I'm going to remind you, though you forgot. Peter, I'm going to remind you, though you have not forgot. And then Paul gives us a very good explanation why. He says, moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preached to you, which you received, and where you stand. Now notice here what Paul is saying. He's telling the people he's going to preach to them, but what is he going to preach to them? The gospel. Now question, have they heard it before? Yes. Did they accept the message before? Yes. Are they being faithful with the message? Yes. It says, which you've heard, received, and in which you stand. So they've heard it. They've accepted it, and they're being faithful. And the crazy thing is, Paul is actually saying that he's the one who preaches to them. 
That's like me coming back next week and preaching the same sermon again. Now, how many of you would think that's the weirdest thing in the world for a preacher to come back and preach the exact same sermon? You'd probably be like, man, this guy's like, he, he literally forgot that he was here already. Paul did that on purpose. He showed up and said, hey, you guys remember when I preached that last sermon on the gospel? They're like, yeah. Remember how you loved it? Yeah. Remember how you guys are doing it? Yeah. I'm going to preach it again. Okay. Why would God have the apostles repeat themselves over and over to the people, though they already know these things? Verse 2. By which you are saved. How many of you are thankful God can save you? Amen. I don't think we, we are amazed at that as much as we should be. God can save you. I was an atheist. I was lost in the world. I was as messed up as you can get messed up in the mind. And God literally plucked me out of the fire and saved my life and put my feet on solid ground and has promised me an eternal life with him, though I don't deserve it at all. That is an amazing fact. Paul says here, the gospel has power to save you if. Ooh, how many of you like the word if? I don't like that word. So I was in junior high. I used to try to make deals with my parents for money because I worked since the third grade, a little trash boy in an apartment complex in San Bernardino. And uh, I like money. And so I remember one time I made a deal with my dad. He actually promised me um, $20 for every A if I got straight A's. Sweet deal. I was like in the seventh grade or something. I was like, sweet deal. $20 for HA? Was that six classes? 120 bucks? Man, you're like king of the world when you're in sixth grade with $120 in your pocket. I showed up, five A's, one B plus. I was excited. I did the math. It's $100. I got five A's. Whew. Nope. My dad said, if you get straight A's. You will get $20 per A if you get straight A's. I had five A's and one B plus. Guess what that is not? That is not straight A's. That is pretty good in my opinion. But it didn't meet the condition for the promise. See, often we miss in the Bible. We all love promises. Trust me, I love the promises in the Bible. They're amazing. They just warm my soul. But often we read the promise, but we don't read the word if and what comes with it. See, God just gave a promise. There is a gospel that can save you, and 99% of preachers will stop right there. The gospel can save you. The gospel will save you. The gospel is powerful. But they don't read the next word. What does God say? If, meaning it can save you based upon a condition. And you don't want to miss out on that condition. Amen. What's the condition? If you hold fast the word I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. Can you believe in vain? Yes or no? You can. Now, how do you hold fast? What, what does it mean to hold fast? The King James will translate this, keep in memory. Revelation will use this play on words in the Greek to talk about holding something in your mind. How do you hold on to the word of God? You spend time thinking about it. I wouldn't even say studying it necessarily. I'm going to go say what the text is implying. You spend time thinking about it. You're going to find out in the Bible, it's not what you know that matters. It's what you spend time thinking about that matters. Let's continue. Proverbs 23, 7 says this. For as he thinks in his heart, what? So is he. This is why. The gospel has power to save you when you actually choose to spend time thinking about the gospel, meditating upon the gospel, contemplating the gospel, because what you think about, you actually become. You ever heard the phrase, you are what you eat? It's a scary phrase when you love Cheetos, amen? Very scary phrase when you love Cheetos. It's equally true, you are what you think. Who you are today, my friends, I'm going to speak very plainly. Whoever you are as a person today is nothing more than the sum total of every thought you've ever thought up to this point. I'll say that again. Who you are today is nothing more than the sum total of every thought that you have 
thought until today. In other words, you made you into you by what you chose to think. Now, that can be discouraging for some, amen? I know, trust me, when I first realized this, I was like, I wept, you know, I was like, oh, why? Why did I think that way for so long? For some of us, that's encouraging because you realize, wait, 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 if that's true, remember, you are what you think, or excuse me, you are what you eat, that principle, right? Let's say I just chose Cheetos and pizza my whole life. Now, at one point, I weighed, I weighed over 400 pounds myself at one point. I chose to eat a certain way, and I became what I ate. But then a day came where I chose to eat differently. And then I became something else. Amen? See, you are what you think, but it doesn't mean you're stuck where you're at, because you can choose to think differently. And in the same way someone can eat differently and change their physical health, you can actually think differently and change your mental status. You can, change, you can literally change who you are. When I, became, uh, when I first showed up at the church, uh, Loma Linda Filipino Church, I was super quiet, super shy. Uh, I was a quiet guy, didn't want to talk to nobody. I would sit at the potluck table. I'd sit at the very end of the potluck table. I'd try to be by myself. When people started migrating there, I'd move to the other tables and kind of migrate away from them. Eventually, I would tug my friend Genesis and be like, yo, let's go eat in the orange trees outside. We would literally climb in the tree, be sitting there eating our potluck in the trees. And you know, we thought it was cool, it was nice, it was whatever. But I just did not like talking to people. Then I went to a Bible college. Have mercy. These kids were like born and raised, you know, Adventist bread, Adventist fed, Adventist till you're dead, that whole thing. Like, and these guys were super bubbly, happy. They came up to me. They're like, do you know what I love about going to a Bible college? I was like, what? They're like, you don't make friends for life. You make friends for eternity. Give me a hug. And I'm like, I've never hugged another a stranger in my life trying to hug on me. Who are you people? It was scary. It was weird. And then I signed up for this thing called coal portering, literature evangelism. I showed up only because a testimony of the church says I should do it. So I did it. And then I find out we're selling books door to door. I died inside. I remember my first door. I knocked on it, talked to the person. I, still, I could still see her face. It's like burned in my mind. And I remember she opened the door and I forgot everything I was supposed to say. I just said, hi, my name is, and all I saw was a blank line in my head. I couldn't remember my name. That's how shy I was. That's how scared I was to talk to people. I was like, my name is, my name is, my name is. She said, what's your name? I said, I don't know. Do you want to buy a book for $20? She said, no. I said, bye, and I ran away. It was horrible. But one day I chose to think differently, to think, okay, God, if you want the gospel to be shared, I want to be a person that will share the gospel. I'm going to think gospel sharing mindset. I'm gonna, when someone says, do you want to get up and share your testimony, though my knees are knocking and I'm petrified, I'm going to think to myself, God will be with me. He will speak through me. Just do it. And because I chose to think differently, I actually became a different person. Eventually became a public evangelist and a Bible teacher. Someone who could not sh talk to a person to save his life, you know, end up doing these things. But it was because God started changing what first? The mind, the thoughts. You see, the Bible says in Luke 6, 45 on the screen, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, but an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The principle is, who you are on the inside, in your heart, in your mind, in your thoughts, will eventually be made clear on the outside. It's only a matter of time. This is why Paul says, think about the gospel. Think about the gospel. I'm going to tell you about the gospel, though I've already preached to you the gospel, because the entire great controversy between Christ and and Satan is a very small battlefield, my friends. The battlefield is right here. It is simply a battle for your, for your mind. Did you know Satan does not need to make you an evil person? He doesn't even need to make you a remotely bad person. He just needs to make your mind so occupied you never have time to get to know God. And when God comes, you will say, Lord, Lord, I've done all these good things. But he'll look and say, but I don't, I don't know you. I know about you. 
you know about me, but we haven't had an experience with each other. This is why the Bible is so passionate about what you, what you think. Now, we know this intuitively. We are what we think. When I was a kid, I was born in Modesto, kind of grew up in a more country-type setting initially, and I actually really wanted to be a rodeo star when I was a kid. Like, this was my dream and ambition. When it was on TV, I was glued to the TV. Like, forget Ninja Turtles, man. It was about the rodeo. Like, the idea of wearing my own Wrangler pants, flannel shirt, and a cowboy hat, like, that was like, man, a little stud walking around with that get up on. You know, that was my mind. This was me. And then I was like, and you know what? Aside from being rodeo, I want to be a professional bass pro fisherman. Literally, that was the career goal. I signed up for every magazine I could that mailed to my house. I studied, you know, I had different tackle boxes for different weather conditions. Oh, is it cloudy? Is it over 70? Okay, this is the, ta- this is the tackle for today. You know, when I get to the lake, look at the water. How clear is it? How dark is it? Which way is the wind blowing? How, how, what's the temperature? I'll do all this calculation. Okay, the fish are right here. I was going to be a bass pro fisherman because this is the environment I grew up in, and this is what I... It's what I thought about, and because I thought about it, that's what I wanted to become. But then, you know, you move as a kid, you get new friends, new styles, new things, and all of a sudden, you know, the mind started to change a little bit. And I went from listening to country music to listening to K-pop and J-pop, right? And like, the transition started occurring. Why? Because I started hanging out with people who didn't wear flannel clothes and cowboy hats. They just didn't do that stuff in Southern California. And I was still a kid, and so because I was surrounded by this new environment, I started thinking new thoughts. I started watching shows with subtitles, right, in different languages. Why? Not because I thought it was the best thing to watch, but that's what everyone, that's what all my friends were. But over time, watching it enough made me think that that was the best type of show ever. And then instead of, like, trying to ride one horse in the rodeo, I decided to try to ride a couple hundred horses around a racetrack. And so life changed. I became a different person. I went through lots of stages. I'm going to skip a lot of it for the sake of time. But kids go through stages, but they go through stages because their environment causes them to think differently. And you are what you think. So this brings me to the most essential skill every Christian needs to learn in the lost art of Christianity when it comes to knowing God. Since the mind is so powerful. It's found in Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. This book of the law, sorry, it's Joshua 1, I believe that's actually verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. Now, I know how we feel as Christians about the word meditate, but bear with me. It's in the Bible, amen? Just bear with me. That you may observe to do according to all that is written. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. How many of you read this verse before? Pretty popular verse. I heard this verse when I was a brand new Christian. I was, I, here's what I heard. This verse is saying, if you have your devotions every day, if you read your Bible every day, God will make you successful. So read your Bible every day, amen? How, I, you're smiling because you heard, the, you heard the verse used that way too. That's not what the verse is saying. Did you notice that? Work it back slowly. What is the promise? You will make your way prosperous, and you will have good success. How many want to be prosperous and successful? Amen? God actually wants you to be prosperous and successful, not just spiritually, but in all avenues of life, just so you know. But in order to, for that promise, what is the condition? It says before that, that you may observe to do according to all that is. Okay, so if you do everything God wrote, then your way will be prosperous and have good success. Oh, that's easy. So just do everything God said. Well, take a, how many of you find it hard to do the things that God says sometimes? For honest, right? You don't have to raise your hand. You can just think to yourself. But notice what it says before doing. But you shall meditate. In it, day and night, notice that you may observe. In other words, too often as Christians, we just see the observe and we try to make ourselves do things. But the Bible actually says that those who do things are those who meditate. The meditation enables you to do the thing. Now, we should know that's true now, because you are what you, oh, right? It's like, wait, I am what I think. So if I think about the things of God, I'll start to do the things of God. 
And as I think and do, God promises I will have good success, not because God is arbitrary, but because his ways are just that good. Amen. What does it mean to meditate? Well, the word in the original language, sorry again for the, the text, the changing it from keynote to PowerPoint messed it up a little bit there. It's the actful thought, uh, it's the act of thoughtful deliberation with the implication of speaking to oneself. You know your inner voice inside your head? You know when you think to yourself, your inner voice? The Hebrew is playing on that concept. It's meditating is actually dialoguing. It's having a conversation. Now, the biblical context is you're con having a conversation with yourself and with God. Amen. See, this is where meditation has a bad rap in Christianity because we think of meditation as emptying one's self. You might have heard that before, right? You need to empty your mind. But the Bible doesn't teach that for meditate. In fact, it's the opposite. To meditate biblically is to fill your mind. But what are you filling your mind with? You're filling your mind with conversation, but you're conversing with who? Or you're conversing with God, but what are you going to be talking with God about? According to Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, you're going to be talking with him about the book of the? His word. Ah. So it's not reading the Bible that causes the change arbitrarily. It's when I choose to spend time meditating and thinking about what the Bible actually said and talk with God about what it said, that it has a change on my life. As I think as Adventist Christians, we're great academic people. I think we are. And I think sometimes we translate that to the Bible. We open it, we learn something new, look up some words, read some verses, underline some things. We clock out, we close it, good, I did my devotions, Whew, I'm good with God for the day. We go about our day, we come back, we clock back in, open it. It's like we're studying a biology textbook, right? My bio in the morning, my bio in the evening, and then life in between. That is not how a walk with God looks like, my friends. A walk with God is a relationship. Imagine if that was like the gist of your relationship when you're married. Hey, we're going to clock in and clock out. Okay, this is the go time and this is the no time, okay? Like, here you can tell me all your problems after that. Please don't bother me. Don't text me. Don't Snapchat me. Don't talk to me. I am busy, and I'll talk to you next week for an hour. Is that going to fly in a relationship, yes or no? And yet we do it to God, and we then ask ourselves, why is my relationship with God struggling? If, you did, if, if a human being came to you and said, yo, I'm struggling. You're my friend. Can you help me? I, I talk to my girl like once a week for an hour, but we're struggling. What's wrong? So, that's a no-brainer. Dude, spend more time with the person you love. Amen? It's literally the same thing with God. Spend more time. If you want a deeper walk with God, if you want a genuine relationship with God, my friends, it is not rocket science. Praise God it's not rocket science. Or I would have been so lost. It is so simple. It is just about spending time every day with him in a genuine relationship. You talking to him and him talking to you through your, through your mind, the beautiful mind that he has created. And this is why Satan loves to attack the mind. As soon as you wake up, your mind just floods with everything that you got to get done. And it's easy for, again, Satan doesn't have to make you bad. He just needs to make you busy. That's it. So busy that you're so occupied, you have no relationship with God until the pro door of probation closes. And then when you look for that high priest, he's no longer in the sanctuary to be found. This is Satan's goal. This is his objective. This is what he wants to do. We're going to skip a lot for the sake of time. If you would like some more information on um, concepts or things on chewing, meditating, thinking on the word, there's a whole bunch of verses right here. I can send this to you. Um, ultimately, I think Philippians 4.8 is the best litmus test. Uh, brethren, whatever things are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, good report, any virtue, any praise, meditate on these things. My friends, you are what you think about. And when you realize this reality, 
when you realize this truth, you will become very careful what you allow into your, into your mind. Because you will not let something in here that you do not want made manifest out here. And this is ultimately how we know and experience God. Last verse, 2 Corinthians 3.18. I'm going to close on this verse. 2 Corinthians 3.18. It says here, But we all, with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. By beholding, you will become changed. But what does it mean to behold? It's what you are beholding or thinking in your mind. To summarize, we talked about our first principle, the power of the mind. You are what you think. Number two, Christians need to learn the art of thinking the way God intended us to think because you are what you think. It's simply a battle for the thoughts. And number three, your life will radically change when you learn to do this. It will radically change when you learn to do this, my friends. When you learn to have a genuine relationship with God, to think about Him, to spend time with Him. And here's the reality. Is it hard at first? Yeah, it's hard. You know this intuitively. When you were in class, is it hard to focus sometimes on class? Yeah, it's easy to get distracted. As humans. How many of you, when you start praying, like your mind is like gone sometimes, right? That happens. And then you like, next thing you know, you're like in a trance in your sleep, right? Even here, someone's mind has probably already drifted the potluck. You're like, you're already like planning what you're going to eat because you saw the kitchen when you walked in. And you're like already organizing your plate because the human mind is just so easily distracted. Question, is it hard at first? The answer is yes. Embrace the struggle. Embrace the challenge of controlling your thoughts, my friends. Because I will tell you what, there is nothing I think greater in life that will pay you more dividends than learning to surrender your mind to God. Nothing. Because once God has your mind, there is no limit to the usefulness of that person who has put self aside and truly made room for God just to 100% do his will. But it's hard at first. And so it takes effort. It takes, it takes trying. It takes discipline, and you're going to try it, and it's going to be hard, and you may fail, but that's okay. Just the next day, do it, try again, and try again, and keep allowing your mind to learn what it means to say no to just thinking about whatever it wants to think about. And when it comes to talking with God, I don't know where you're at, but it's okay where you're at. I started with an awkward high. My very first prayer, remember, I was an atheist. Someone convinced me through the book of Daniel that God was real. And I was like, oh, wow. Like, I've messed up. I lived in Menton at the time. I walked in the backyard. I looked up at the starry sky. And I remember that night. It was a Saturday night in 2007. And I remember I looked up at the sky, and I just waved at the sky. I said, hi. You must be God. It's nice to meet you. I'm Tony. Tony. But you probably already knew that because, you know, you're God. So looking forward to get to know you. Good night. I went to bed. It was super weird. Guys, it was the weirdest thing. Trust me. I don't even know if my family had been looking in the backyard. I'm sure it would have looked super weird, man. Just like waving at the sky, talking to the sky, right? It was an awkward high. I'm not quick to be the social guy. It was super awkward. But it's okay to start with an awkward high, amen? If you don't know God, it's okay. Just start with the, hi, I'm, I'm X. You're God. Let's start talking and let's be, let's be like awkward acquaintances. That's okay. Let's, let's start there. And over time, that awkward acquaintance can become a normal acquaintance. Amen? And then over time, that normal acquaintance can actually become a friend. And with time, that friend can become that BFF, that best friend. And with enough time, that friend becomes an engagement partner. And that engagement partner becomes a spouse. 
If you don't love God today, I'm going to say something preachers never say. That's okay. You do not have to love God today. But God calls you to get to know him today. And he is so amazing. I can tell you this. It took me a couple of years. It, but, but he is so amazing that if you spend enough time with him, you will eventually fall in love with the guy. Because there is no one greater out there than God. There is no one who will love you more than God. There is no one out there who will wow you more than God will wow you. And I still remember the day when I started laughing and I said, I love God. Who would have thought this former atheist, a couple years later, could genuinely say, I love Jesus? Not because it's the right thing to say, not because it's the cliche thing to say, but genuinely over time through knowing him, he won my heart. And I literally fell in love with him. How do you want to love Jesus? Amen? My friends, it starts with an awkward high. Open up the Bible and say hi. Spend time. Allow your mind to just talk with him about what you're reading. Visualize the story and just start learning what it means to spend time with him, to have a relationship with him. And here's the beautiful thing. It doesn't matter where you're at in that relationship journey. As long as you have a relationship with him, you are in a saved experience with Jesus. Amen? Whether you're the thief on the cross saying awkward high and you die that day, guess where he's going? He's going to be with Jesus in paradise. Amen? Amen. Doesn't matter how much good things you do. Doesn't matter how much information you know. Do you have a daily relationship with Jesus? If you do, you can be assured of this. He will see you in paradise. How many want that experience? Amen? Amen? Father in heaven, thank you for the chance to study your word. There's so much more that could be said, Lord. Thank you for guiding my thoughts and condensing these presentations. And I pray earnestly for my friends, Lord. I am convicted more now than ever before. Our thoughts are so powerful. Our thoughts are so important. You literally are simply trying to woo our minds with loving kindness so that we would choose to commune with you. We would choose to think about you. We would choose to think on these things that we would give less time to just thinking on the things of the world and actually give time to thinking on your things thinking on spiritual things, thinking on holy things. Lord, when we're lost and confused and don't know the next step, remind us this is just another beautiful relationship that we get to experience in life. And help us to think on our earthly relationships, to learn valuable lessons on what it means to have a good quality relationship with you. Bless us to this sin. Hold us in your hand. And I pray that you help us to make it all to that, that beautiful day when we see Christ coming again. In Jesus' name, amen.